Welcome back to another exciting episode of History Reminds Us. I'm your host, Chris, and today we'll embark on a captivating journey to discover the secrets of the Battle of Stones River. Strap in because we're about to experience a full tour like no other. Our adventure begins here at the hollow grounds of Stones River National Battlefield. This pivotal Civil War battle fought between December 31st, 1862 through January 2nd, 1863, was one of the bloodiest conflicts in American history. Tour stop one, the eve of the battle. The Union Army set its lines with its left lying on the Stones River, running south along McFadden's Lane. This line stretched for about three miles. The Confederate Army of Tennessee, commanded by General Braxton Bragg, held roughly parallel positions from a quarter to a half mile to the east. While the men in blue and gray tried to rest, the commanders planned the, com the coming fight. General Roskins and Bragg ultimately came up with a similar plans, each aimed to attack their enemy's right flank and cut off their supply line and route of escape. While the generals and their staff planned, one of the most unique and emotional moments of the battle of Stones River unfolded. Tour Stop 2, The Slaughter Pen. The Battle of Stones River began at 6 a.m. on December 31st. 1862. The Confederate divisions of Generals McCrown and Claiborne smashed into the right flank of the Union lines near the intersec intersection of Grissom Lane and the Franklin Pike. The Union right crumbled and were soon sent flying north and west in disarray. Further down the Union line, General Philip Sheridan had his men up and ready to fight by 4 a.m. As the Confederates descended upon their position, they stopped and beat back attacks to their front. However, they soon had to contend with the threats to their right and rear as the Union line continued to fall back. Sheldon's division bent backwards as they struggled to keep the enemy in front of them. In the process, two of Sheldon's brigade commanders, General Josh Joshua Steele and Colonel George Roberts were killed. Some of Sheldon's regiments lost more than half of their men before they moved north of Wilkinson Pike to the, to the cover of dense cedar forest. While Sheldon's division slowly bent back to the Wilkinson Pike, General James Negley's men stood their ground. They beat back several Confederate attacks from the east. Private J.E. Roebuck of the 29th Mississippi Infantry described the fighting here. Our regiment was on a large field in which corn had grown, but the stalks had been cut. The Yankees had planted a battery in the cedar grove across the field, and the regiments were ordered to charge and take the battery. When we started across the field, I thought those were the deepest middles between corn rolls I had ever seen. They were among the trees while we're in an open field, so they were just mowing us down like weeds. We were ordered to fall down to escape the bullets, shells, and cannonballs. I, char I changed my opinion about the middles. They appeared to be entirely too shallow. By 10 a.m., the Confederates had pushed Sheldon and Negley into a B formation. Sheldon's line faced south while Negley's division still fired to the east. This dangerous position risked seeing both divisions cut off from the rest of the army as the Confederates attacked from all sides. Yet they had no choice. Orders had arrived from General Roskins, informing both generals that they must hold to buy time for the rest of their army to regroup along the Nashville Pike. Upon re receiving their orders to stand fast, General Negley's men sought safety among the limestone outcroppings and trees beyond them. It worked for a time. The Union forces here stalled nearly half the Confederate army for two hours. At noon, Sheldon's lines finally broke. This allowed Confederate soldiers to begin to sur surround Negley's men from the rear. The boys in blue found their rocky shelter had now become a death trap. Tour Stop 3, the Cotton Field. As the fighting raged on the, in the slaughter pen, General Roskins was spending the time brought by Sheldon 
and Negley Well, Roskins canceled his attack across the Stones River and sent reserve units into the fight. He rallied the shattered and fleeing troops from the earlier Confederate assaults. To support them, he positioned large numbers of art artillery on the heights between the road and the railroad. Here, over 30 cannons had a clear shot at the Confederates as they emerged from the forest. Roskins reformed his line into a horseshoe to protect the Nashville Pike. This vital road was Roskins' only means of retreat should the ar army falter. If the Confederates could take the road, Union defeat w would be certain. Confederates arrived piecemeal at the tree line south of Nashville Pike. Tired, running low on ammunition, and disorganized, they had been moving nonstop since the attack began that morning. The thick cedar forest had slowed their advance and cut them off from their supply wagons. General James Raines was one of the first Confederate commanders to arrive at the edge of the tree line. He seized the initiative and ordered his men forward towards the Nashville Pike. A storm of musket and cannon fire tore through the Confederate ranks and killed Raines almost as soon as he left the cover of the trees. Their attack soon fizzled out. Jo General George Manny thought a large attack would fare better. He ordered his men to hold at the fence line to wait for more Confederate forces before attacking, but his attack failed as well. That afternoon, ev even larger Confederate attacks continued to push across the fields towards the Nashville Pike. Each time they stalled and broke down, broke under the resistance and devastating fire of Union infantry and artillery. As the day ended, it became clear that the Confederates would not be able to take the Nashville Pike. Here, they could only hope their Comrades further down the line were more successful. Tour stop four, holding fast, shouts of give them hell rose up from the men who fought on this ground. As the Confederates broke through the tree line onto the field, two untested units anchored this part of the Union line, the Chicago Board of Trade Battery and the Pioneer Brigade. The Chicago Board of Trade Battery's creation was in response to President Lincoln's call for 300,000 volunteers. The unit took on the name of their sponsors, the wealthy businessmen and merchants of the Chicago Board of Trade. The Stones River Campaign was their first taste of combat. Their assignment was to support another unit, the Pioneer Brigade, as it carried out its duties. Union General William S. Roskins understood that an army on the march was only as good as the roads that carried them. To address this, he ordered that two men from each company in the army be selected for their skill with an axe and a shovel to serve in a pioneer brigade. The pioneers built and repaired roads, bridges, and fortifications. When the army encountered the enemy, they were to return to their original units and take up arms. When the fight came to the pioneers at Stones River, there was no time for them to return to their original units. On the afternoon of December 31st, 1862, the Confederates attacked the Union troops here three times. The Confederates came within 50 yards of the Union line before they faltered. A Union sergeant of the Pioneer Brigade recalled the rebel flag seen dimly through the smoke and trees wibbled started forward and then surged back. Yes, there was no mistake about it. It was going back. The Chicago Board of Trade Battery fired nearly 1,300 rounds into their attackers that afternoon. The Union, union counter-charged and the line moved forward about a quarter of a mile to a small ridge lost earlier in the day. The Chicago Board of Trade Battery and the Pioneer Brigade had passed their baptism of fire and by doing so, kept the Nashville Pike in Union hands. Tour Stop 5, Hell's Half Acre, on December 31st, 1862, the men of Colonel William B. Hazen's brigade found themselves at a critical point. They held the Union line between Nashville Pike and Nashville and Chattanooga Railroad, in an area known as the Round Forest. The Confederates attacked four times that day, and after each attack, their casualties only grew. J. Morgan Smith of the 32nd Alabama 
described the Confederate losses. We charged in 50 yards of them, and had not the timely order of retreat been given, none of us would now be left to tell the tale. Our regiment carries 280 into action and came out with 58. The carnage left in the wake of the Hazards Brigade's defiant stand lent the place a new name, Hell's Half Acre. Colonel Hazen's brigade was the only Union unit not to retreat on December 31st. Uh, no, no, Their stand served as the anchor point in the line that held the Nashville Pike and secured a Union victory. After the battle, General William Ros Roskin set his soldiers to work building fortifications on the outskirts of Murfreesboro. This new fort, named Fortress Roskin, served as a vital supply base. It supplied Union forces as they pushed towards Tahoma and eventually Chattanooga. While working on the fortification, some of Hazen's men decided to build a monument to honor their fallen comrades. They chose their brigade cemetery as the, as the site located at the edge of the round forest constructed construction began in june of 1863 and took about six months to complete in 1864 two skilled stone cutters sergeant daniel c miller and private christian buoff of the 115th ohio infantry carved inscriptions into the four faces of the monument. Tour Stop 6, McFadden's Farm. Both armies spent New Year's Day reorganizing, resupplying, and caring for the wounded and dead. Confederate General Bragg thought that Union General Roskins would retreat back towards Nashville. Instead, Roskins decided that they should stay and fight and prepare to defend th his position. Union General Cleve's division, commanded by General Bedden, moved down the dirt road leading from the McFadden family farm to the river. They crossed and took up position on a hill east of the river that stood as the highest ground on the battlefield. The soldiers worked through the night to fortify three lines of defense. On the morning of January 2, 1863, Confederate General John C. Beckenridge discovered the Federals had taken the high ground. He immediately reported the situation to General Braxton Bragg. Bragg knew his chances of victory were slim if he left his enemy in control of that position. He ordered Beckenridge to take the hill. General Beckenridge reluctantly, reluctantly ordered his 4,500 men to attack with one round loaded and bayonets fixed to their muskets. The assault began at 4 p.m., the Confederates charged forward and dove the enemy from the hill. They reformed and began pursuing the fleeing men in blue. For a moment, victory seemed to be within the Confederates' grasp. Along the opposite bank of the river, Union artillery trained their guns on the gray mass and waited for the chance to tr change the tide of the battle. As the Confederates came within range, the cannons began to fire. The earth shook and explosions ripped the air. For, for the Confederates' horror and dis despair dashed the momentum thrill of victory. In 1906, the Nashville, Chattanooga, and St. Louis Railroad dedicated this monument on the site where Union artillery did its deadly work on January 2, 1863. The plaque on the monument reads, On January 2, 1863, at 3 p.m., there were stationed on this hill 58 cannon commanding the field across the river as the Confederates advanced over this, this field. The shot and shell from these guns resulted in a loss of 1,800 killed and wounded in less than an hour.